Hello, everybody, and welcome to the eighth YouTube session of the Pixel Project's ninth fall edition of our Read for Pixels campaign. My name is Anusha Kandasivam. I'm your moderator for this session. Through Read for Pixels, the Pixel Project is collaborating with 11 award-winning best-selling authors to raise awareness about violence against women and to raise funds for the Pixel Project to keep our efforts to end violence against women alive and kicking. I'll be telling you more about the Read for Pixels fundraiser uh, a little later. We have lots and lots of author goodies, but uh, meanwhile, to find out more about the Pixel Project, uh, about the work we do, go to our website, www.thepixelproject.net. Okay, so we have a uh, Amazing special guest for today's uh, Read for Pixel discussion and Q&A sessions. It is the fabulous YA fantasy author, Namina Farna. Hi, Namina. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, all right, so let me give you guys a little introduction. Oh, wait, uh, you come with. Oh, and. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> She's like, <so> cute. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Namira is a young adult novelist based in Los Angeles, and she is the author of the epic fantasy YA novel, The Gilded Ones. Uh, originally from Sierra Leone, West Africa, she moved to the US when she was nine years old, and she has been traveling back and forth ever since. Namina loves building fantastical worlds and telling stories with fierce female leads. Okay, so Namina has also very generously donated a selection of super exclusive goodies to the stash of author goodies we have set up as perks for donors on our Read for Pixels Rally Up fundraising page. Okay, so let me tell you about them. We have three bundles. The first one uh, is for donors in the US only, is Namina Forna's first edition Gilded Ones goodie bundle. This uh, very special and exclusive treat for one US-based Read for Pixels donors comprises one signed first edition hardcover set of the Gilded Ones novels which are including, which is the Gilded Ones and the Merciless Ones. So there are two uh, out of the trilogy. And uh, the first hand, uh, one handwritten note from Namina herself, one Gilded Ones character card, one print of the map of the Gilded Ones world, and one pre-order pin, which is it's an amazing bundle. Okay, so bundle number two, also for US donors only, it is the Random House Children's Books uh, bundle. So for donors who are looking for a smaller bundle, Random House Children's Books is generously offering an exclusive Gilded Ones bundle for one book-loving donor in the US. So this will be one paperback edition of the Gilded Ones. Uh, this will be unsigned and one print of the map of the world of the Gilded Ones. And the next one is for donors worldwide. This is a very special one. Namina Forna is uh, offering a 30-minute Zoom call with you. So she has graciously donated 30 minutes of her time to be claimed by one donor anywhere in the world where Namina will be happy to chat about art and craft of writing, publishing books, your favorite Gilded Ones characters, and any much more with you or your group. This session will be conducted in English and it's open to individual donors, book clubs, or libraries. Now, there's only one of the session available, so donate now to book the slot with Namina before it's gone. Um, yeah, so all these goodies are available on our Rally Up fundraising page. And Denisha, our moderator, has uh, chat box moderator, has put up the link in the description. In, sorry, in the chat box on YouTube. So go check that out. We've raised one thousand eight hundred and eighty-five dollars towards a five thousand goal so five thousand dollar goal so far. So please do give generously before the fundraiser ends in October. All funds go towards the Pixel Project's work to help end violence against women. Okay, so. Now, you all can participate. Um, you can ask Namina your questions. Just make sure you're logged into your YouTube account so you can type your questions into the chat box. And Denisha, who is the chat box moderator, will relay the questions to me, and I'll read them out to Namina to answer. OK, so on to the reading. Namina, tell us what you're reading for us today. Um, so I am reading a selection from The Gilded Ones, which is the first book in The Gilded Ones trilogy. Uh, and this portion is what I sort of feel is like the heart of the book. Uh, it's really early over here, so I don't know where you guys are, but I hope you'll enjoy this. Um, but yeah. Okay, take it away. When we finish lessons later that night, Belcalis and I remain behind to pack up the weapons. We all take turns every evening, and tonight it's our turn to shine and store the swords from practice. As usual, they're filthy. So we have to carefully soak them in aqua regia and then scrub them to remove the gold crust from the blood that was spilled. I do so even more vigorously than usual, my mind ablaze with all the things I've learned today. White hands freed us from the death mandate and gave us the chance to fight. Just as she promised, 
wear the emperor's crown jewels and will ride at his side in less than two months and deliver Otera from the death shrieks once and for all. She's proven herself a woman of her word again and again. So why do I feel so uneasy? As I finish polishing the swords in the arm armory, I turn to Belcalis. She's making more aqua regia, her eyes troubled as she mixes the chemical solution. Usually, I would just leave her to her thoughts, but today has been a strange day. I need someone to talk to. Can you believe it was white hands all along, I say, hoping to start a conversation. I walk over to where she's working. What good fortune we've had that she came along. Had we been born just a year earlier, we'd have already been executed. Good fortune. The word drips like acid from Belcalis's lips. Is there such a thing for our kind? I turn to find her shaking, every muscle quivering with barely suppressed fury. Even though she rarely speaks about her past, I know she was somewhere awful before she came here. Wherever it was, I know that it was even worse than the temple cellar, that it was so nightmarish, she wakes up screaming at least once every few weeks and is filled with a constant, unending supply of pain and rage. What happened to you? What happened to me? These things, they alter us, Belcalis says. They change us in the most fundamental ways. The emperor and his men, they can use white hands and the rest of the Karmakas to make us into warriors. They can even give us absolution, but they can never change what they did. They can never take back the horrors that have already been inflicted upon us. Gold on the floor, the look in father's eyes. The memory of my torture surges before I can stop it, that familiar heaviness accompanying it, that pain and humiliation once more surfacing. I've been so dedicated building myself into the perfect warrior these past few months. Did I really think I'd gotten past all this? Did I really think I could forgive and forget just like that? If it weren't for white hands, I'd still be in that cellar and the elders would still be doing what they did, taking advantage of my ignorance, my desperation to ensure that I committed, continued submitting to the atrocities they disguised as piety. The realization slaps me in the face, as does another. I don't remember things that, as like I used to, I whisper, looking up at Belcalis. For once, I allow myself to feel the pain coiling inside me, the pain I so often stifle in an effort to pretend I'm fine. I used to have excellent memory, but ever since the cellar, little things escape me, like father's face. The only thing I can remember, the only thing I remember about him now is his expression as he beheaded me in the cellar. His features, what his smile looked like, I don't remember any of it anymore. It's a devastating, awful admission, and I gasp for air, trying to steel myself against the force of it. I know what he did was wrong, but he's my father, the only one I have anyway. There were good times before. Now... Every time I try to remember him, his face slips away. I look down, surprised to find tears in my eyes. All my memories from before, they just keep slipping through my fingers. Is that why I forgot my anger so easily? Is that why I forgot everything that I'd gone through? I was 13 when it happened, Belcala says softly, turning to me. I cut myself slicing onions. Onions. Can you imagine how stupid it, that is? Girls aren't supposed to play with knives. When my father saw the blood, he knew immediately what, he, what it was. He was a priest, you see. He thought that it was Oyomo's will that my blood had appeared so young, a sign that I was meant to be spared. So he called his brother in Garcalgaras and asked him to help me disappear into the city so I'd never have to undergo the ritual of purity. Father trusted his brother, loved him. He was an apothecary, a good man who helped people. She laughs a short, bitter laugh. It wasn't even a month before that good man sold me to the brothel. But that was his mistake, you see. When the procurer saw my golden blood, realized that it was actually real, they killed him immediately so he would never lead the Jatu to them, mistakenly or not. And then they offered me to their most particular clients the ones who like to hurt children, like to watch as they scream. My hands are trembling now. There's so much pain in Belcalis's eyes, I feel the echo of it deep inside me. 
Belcalis, I see. You don't have to. They would give them a knife as they came into the room. Belcalis's voice is low and pained as she continues. You can do whatever you want to her and she'll heal. That's what they told them. She'll heal. Belcalis's voice breaks at these words. No matter what you do, no matter how badly you hurt her, grind her beneath your feet, she'll heal. She'll always be good as new, even if you slit her throat. Belkal sobs brokenly and something inside me shatters. These fast, past few months, I've been so determined to bury my pain, to prove to myself that I'm fine. I've been so focused on my own troubles, I've forgotten that the other girls were suffering too. Belkalis, I whisper. She abruptly reaches for the ties of her robe, begins untying them. My eyes widen. Belkalis, you don't have to. I want you to see, she insists. Remember those scars you saw so long ago? Look now. She takes off her robe and turns, offering me her back. I blink, startled. They're gone. Her back is completely smooth now. But of course it is. The only scars that ever remain are the ones acquired before the blood turns. Once I stopped being hurt, being violated, they faded. She smiles bitterly. And that's the worst part. The physical body, it heals. The scars fade, but the memories are forever. Even when you forget, they remain inside you, taunting you, resurfacing when you least expect. My entire body is trembling now. I'm so sorry, I whisper. I'm so very sorry. Belkal shakes her head. I don't want you to be sorry. I, she says, I want you to keep the memory of my scars. I need someone to remember what happened to me. I need someone to... I rush to her and gather her in my arms. I won't forget, I promise her. I'll never forget. The tears Belkalis has been holding back for so long burst out of her in big heaving sobs. Don't you dare, she cries. Don't you dare. They might need us now because we're valuable. Might pretend to accept us, to reward us but never forget what they did to us first. If they did it once, Dika, they'll surely do it again, no matter the promised flowery promises they give. I won't forget, I promise, tears streaming down my face, determination building in my heart. I'll never forget. And that's where I stop. Thanks for that, Narina. That was very intense and very moving as well. I remember reading this and yeah, it's very moving. <laughs> um, um, oh, and also to give context, um, in my trilogy, The Gilded Ones, uh, the girls are semi-mortal warriors and they bleed gold and are faster and stronger than regular people. And because of this, people think they're monsters until actual monsters come in and people realize, oh, we need these girls to fight these monsters. So yeah. when the girls are talking about the gold and the blood and all of that, it's because they bleed gold and they heal after. Yeah, it's an amazing story. If you haven't read it, go and get it. It's amazing. All right, so I'm going to start the questions off with um, talking about the your female characters. So we just met Deca and Belkalis. And um, Deca is honestly one of the most badass feminist YA heroines in recent memory. And there's a, a whole cast of empowered and very powerful female characters. There's Belkalis, there's Britta, Andyway, White Hands, so many more. They're all very complex and they're well-rounded characters and they have agency on, you know, somewhat in the beginning, maybe they don't, but then it, it eventually they become strong physically, mentally, they're determined women. So my question is, what or who are your inspirations for your female characters? Hmm. So um, I would say Initial, like one of the initial inspirations um, for the Gilded Ones um, are actually, um, they're called the Dahomey Amazons. They have a couple of names, also the non Maton, uh, which means our mothers, um, among other things. Although I might be wrong about the, that meaning. Um, but anyway, so I was, I was very fascinated when I first heard about them from like my father. He was like, there were once actual Amazons. These were uh, women who were initially deemed unruly. So uh, basically their families were like, you can't stay with us. So they like gave them um, to the emperor, uh, to the king of Dahomey. Um, the initial one was, I believe, Gezo. So they like were like, take these, you know, unruly girls. Um, and uh, 
once like and once they did he was like all right cool i'll take them and i'll use them as elephant hunters but these women were so good at elephant hunting um mm -hmm. that he that he was like hmm maybe i'll make them into an elite force and mm -hmm. so they started training these women um in all types of like extremely brutal ways and they became basically so feared that people would like not look at them when they were walking past like wow. these were like women who like i believe it was the french army don't quote me but, like when they came to like attack dahomey like the the Amaz like these women just basically like routed them like they were the things that like um again i'm not sure if it's the french i think it's the french were like were scared of like these were actual women so um they were, and uh, by the way, the woman, the uh, woman king, um, the movie that's out now is um, actually also based on the Dahomey Amazons, um, although there's like some things there. Um, but so that was one of my inspirations, but also just uh, the women in my life, um, you know, like uh, I've been lucky to grow up in a family that is actually predominantly women. Like my grandmother had eight, my a maternal grandmother had eight children um, and seven of them were women, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like my other, uh, like, so it's like our family is just filled with all these sort of strong and powerful women who, um, you know, even growing up in Sierra Leone, which especially at the time when they were, like my mother is in her 60s, like when she was growing up, like there was just no, you know, there was no space for women, no, like, like, like the agency, like for, for women, like Sierra Leone is an extremely patriarchal um, society, but these women sort of grabbed that power mm -hmm. and took it. Like my grandmother, like when she saw like what education did, like my grandmother um, was an uneducated woman. Um, she was one of three wives you know, um, she had she had had polio as a child. So like, mm -hmm. basically, she um, always like walked with a limp, very small woman, but and had but like when she saw what education had done, she was like, all right, um, I am educating by hook or by crook all my children. And indeed, um, she like basically, you know, managed to pay for all of her children's for all of her children to go to school. And the ones who like went to school, like, um, went on to become like uh, lawyers and doctors and like UN people and like politicians. Like, so just imagine like in, in the space of one generation, my grandmother, who was again, an uneducated um, child bride. Cause like her, her parents gave her to like my grandfather when she was like 15 and he was like in his forties. So an uneducated, um, basically child bride managed to educate most of her children and to basically like propel them in like one generation to, you know, like rising from like basically the, the hood. Um, yeah. and so, yeah. yeah, yeah, I can see why that inspired you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, well, I think then perhaps Decca kind of embodies your grandmother because she she faces so much in her life, right? There's uh, sexism, misogyny, racism from people in her village. She turns out to be feared and reviled as a gilded one. She's forced to fight monsters in a world that has treated her as less than human. And, um, you know, she overcomes all these obstacles. Why did you decide to create a protagonist who faces all these unique and such a heavy combination of challenges? Um, so, hmm. Because I have had the glory of growing up in not just one, but two <laughs> intense patriarchies, but also traveling a lot and just seeing sort of the, you know, the commonalities there. I, when I grew up in Sierra Leone, it was, uh, it was very expected that like as a girl, um, hi, hi. Hi, um, hi, hi. We figured this was better <laughs> for a chat. Yeah, so yeah. like I can see your face, yay. Yeah. We, we, we're out here having this breakfast conversation. That's what we're doing. Although it's lunch, dinner, you want to talk? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever so, meal you want it to be. <laughs> so, um, so when I was growing up in Sierra Leone, like you knew like as a girl, like basically we're not valued um, as much as boys were, right? And mm -hmm. like, it was, it was like simply like, 
you wake up in the morning, you have all these chores. Meanwhile, your brothers are like sleeping. You are accepted. You are expected to cook, clean. You know, just there's a word in Sierra Leone that I hate. It's called like bear, like bear it, right? So like whatever happens, whatever it is you go through, um, especially in your marital home or or in your home in general, as a woman, you're supposed to bear it. And so I, like I left early when I was nine, but I grew up looking at this and being like, this isn't right. But every time I would ask it, um, about this, like basically, um, basically everyone would be like, oh no, like, you know, this is how it is. And also the Bible and the Quran, because like Sierra Leone is like 80% Muslim and like, um, but like it, it, Sierra Leone is a weird place in that we have like, um, we have like a lot of religious tolerance in that like really doesn't matter what religion you are. Like people will go to uh, mosque on Friday and go to church on Sunday. Like, so I grew up going to mosque and church. Like literally I've been to like all of the, all the different denominations. Like literally if you came in and you had a God, we would go and we would worship because for us it was like, it's all the same thing. Yeah. Um, right. And so like, I grew up like going to all these different things and seeing, Hmm, like this, this flowery language that like, it, like people are saying like things in such nice ways, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's really messed up. And then I moved to America and like I lived um, down the road from New Birth Baptist Church, which was like one of those mega churches. And like I grew up in America during purity culture. And, and what was fascinating to me about America was that it was the same thing as Sierra Leone. It was just like uh, it was just more polite. And it's people language, like, yeah. Yeah. And people would always be like, oh, you know, those people over there, you know, mm -hmm. like they want like, oh, the third world countries. But I believe like mm -hmm. looking like y'all, y'all doing this, like it's the same thing. It's just that you guys aren't saying it out loud. You, the, the silent part mm -hmm. is silent, but it's still the same thing. And it was it was interesting to me. And then I spent like a lot of like times in like a lot of time uh, times in other countries. Like, for instance, I used to um, go to Tunisia like for summers, like, um, and like all across all of these different countries, I would see the same thing. Um, but it would always be it would always be this gaslighting and this language. And that's what I was fascinated by was this language of oppression, because the language of oppression says that um, it says that we're doing this for your own good. And why are you questioning? Why are you, this is all for your own good. We're here to protect you. Meanwhile, all your rights and stuff are being stripped away. Yeah. And so it was only when I went to college, um, I went to Spelman College, HBCU, all black, all female, yay. And I took women's studies classes. And that's when I was like, oh, it's a system. Uh, like, yeah. wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, now that, I've been doing this pixel project uh, work for a long time, um, 10 years or almost 10 years. And, you know, when you're younger, you don't really realize this because let me tell you, I mean, I, I'm in Asia, I'm in Southeast Asia, I'm Southeast Asian, and it's the same here. Mm -hmm. It's couched in this language of, you know, we're, it's for your own good. We're protecting you. And this is how it's always been. But this is what girls do. This is how girls behave. And this is what boys do. And this is, uh, and girls can only do these things. And, and you think, okay, this is normal. And then, you start hearing other people's stories, you start learning about it, and you think, ah, it's a system. <laughs> it's just all, yeah, it's all the same all over the world. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, okay, moving on to the next question. Um, in your Reef Pixels AMA, you did a, a really great AMA for us. You described the Gilded Ones as a very violent, very kick butt look at what it means to live in a patriarchal society, what system supports it, uh, who suffers, who gains, and it's kind of like 300 with girls pretty cool description. Um, why did you decide to take the approach of creating this brutally patriarchal society and culture instead of one that is more gender equitable? Um, because it's the truth. Like, that's the thing. Like, it's the truth. Like, it's so funny. I initially wrote The Gilded Ones in 2012 right? Like I wrote the first draft in 2012. And then I came back in 2018 and like tossed the first draft aside and I rewrote it. But I think like the Gilded Ones was very prescient because what I was noticing um, in America at that time, because I was going to film school, mm -hmm. was like, we're seeing the like, I like, I it was it was almost like I was being gaslit left and right. Like, I'm just like, this place is extremely violent. There is so much violence here, but it is this violence that's under the surface. And like, that's, it's the truth of the nature of like, um, 
yeah. of the world. Like I think America for a long time has been very, I wouldn't say lucky, um, but, but America for a long time has not sort of existed in the reality of what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas other places um, are more overt, right? Um, I don't actually, I don't actually think that the, that um, the world of the Gilded Ones is actually that far-fetched because a lot of things that happen in the book are happening all across the world right now. And I wanted to reflect that as um, someone who is like, I consider myself a third culture, like a global citizen, because like, you know, I, I move between different countries rather frequently. So it's like, I see that reality um, in so many different ways expressed for women. Um, but also when the other reason was like, when I saw 300, I was just like, you know, like I felt that rah, 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 but I was like, wow, this is a, extremely racist and misogynistic movie wow we love it but i was like you know but like and i was and and like here's the thing even then like i felt this thing where i was like those moments where like leonidas and his men were like you know going to kick butt i was like this is this is this is racist is all hell but like i yeah. i want that like i want that feeling of yes. like a group of women like in armor just like walking slow motion on the battlefield and you know they're about to kick butt and like in fact when i was in college i'd have recurring dreams of of that of like this one girl in golden armor which was what like sort of spurred the initial idea for the gilded ones mm. um, but so like i wanted that feeling um, but I also wanted to reflect that, like, if these girls are fighting, what are they fighting? And what they're fighting is the reality of this world. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I chose to set it in the type of world that I did, because that world was truthful. And indeed, now um, I um, I know you're in the UK, but if you see like sort of like what's going on the in the US with like um, abortion rights and all these things, it is the reality that we're living. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, you write YA, all genres have their shares of female stereotypes and tropes, and you've included a few classic YA tropes in your stories. So we have the chosen one uh, with special abilities. We have a sort of magic school, mm -hmm. and but your characters are anything but stereotypical. Mm -hmm. How do you subvert stereotypes to create a female character with agency who deals with the world around her, including situations that involve sexism, misogyny, violence against women and girls? Um. Well, I think it's like writing real people. So initially when I wrote Deka, um, she, you know, she came out the womb kicking butt. Like I saw her as a Buffy-like character and like my first draft, she was definitely like Buffy. She was all questioning and whatever. But that wasn't a truthful person, you know? Um, and so when I went back to um, rewrite, I had to like take a step back and be like, what is the truth? Who are the people that I know? Who are the girls that I know? The femme presenting people that I know? Mm -hmm. um, and how do they deal with living in a world like, like the one in the, um, in the book? And the thing is, um, I had so many stories, like, because like I grew up in Sierra Leone during the not fun times, Mm -hmm. um, of like women surviving those times um, and women in my family surviving that I was like, all right, if I'm going to write these characters, they're going to be an homage to people that I actually know, um, but also they're going to react in ways that are actually real. So like with Deka, um, Deka goes through this whole like sort of... Um, awakening as a character because when we first meet her she's someone who chose the line because that's what you do when you grow up in a society like this when you are being pressured and gaslit at every you know to toe the line and not only that you convince yourself that you want to toe the line and that's what Deka does but it's only when she comes into contact with other women and other girls uh people her age who are questioning that she starts questioning too. And that is the reality. Because like, I mean, that's also my, re like I questioned when I was a kid, but I made sure to like, after I asked one or two times and got shut down, I stopped questioning. It was only when I went to Spelman um, that, I, that I learned to question again, which is why there's the quote unquote magic school. <laughs> the magic school is like where your eyes are awakened. It's like yeah. 
Spelman. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. So speaking of uh, these women with determination who ask questions and everything, so they are tough and multifaceted. They're black women and girls. But um, some readers may perceive their strength, determination, resourcefulness, uh, and human flaws as unlikable or ruthless instead of lauding them as likable or strong and determined as they would have if they were, for example, male and white. Uh, do you ever feel pressured by gender and cultural stereotypes to make your female characters more likable or relatable? And have you got any flack for not making a female character likable enough? Mm, well, I've... Um... I don't feel that pressure um, because um, I always seek to represent um, different cultures and ethnicities um, and mm -hmm. um, expressions in my books. So like there's not only, my main characters are not only black, you know, they're Latina, um, they're Asian. Like I try to make sure that I have like a good mix of uh, not only races, but like, um, gender expressions either um overt or sort of subtle or um and also of course uh sexualities um and i have gotten like some comments of you know um this person is unlikable and this person is unlikable but um i do think that most people tend to resonate um with these characters um, and the reason I, I i think that is because even when they're frustrating they're real um, yeah. And I think like that's the main thing is going back to always keeping that touchstone of are, are these people that I believe? That's the most in, important mm -hmm. thing. It's not, is this someone I like? Is this someone that I believe that I root for? And that's yeah. the more important thing. Because I do feel like you can write characters that are straight up um, assholes. Um, but like if there's someone who's like a magnificent asshole and you can root for them, there's something there. Yeah, you're you're totally right. Yeah, yeah, like a a really great slash horrible villain who is just such a big asshole, but you you just want to see, you want to follow their journey, right? Mm -hmm. Could be someone like that. Yeah, All right. So okay, so your books definitely pass the Bechdel test with the inclusion of complex yet intensely supportive relationships between women. Why do you think many uh, science fiction fantasy authors still have trouble writing stories that pass the Bechdel test, despite the fact that there are so many more things that women talk about other than men? Hmm. Um, well, um, I, I'll answer this a different way. Well, I think one of the reasons why my books um, pass the Bechdel test is because I don't, in fact, read that much science fiction um, and fantasy. I mean, make no mistake, I read it, but in romance novels, right? So, like, what I'm saying is that um, I read outside of my genre. Right. So like when mm -hmm. I'm writing books, they might not seem like um, they, they seem to be melds of genres. And that's because I'm reading a lot of stuff outside of the genre, because I think when you grow up as um, a genre, as a genre buff and like you interface, um, especially with like a lot of fandoms and things like that, I, I think that sometimes that can constrain you. Um, mm -hmm. You can be constrained by what you think are the expectations of genre. And so that's why I'm very careful to like always, if I'm reading, if I'm writing in this genre, I'm reading in another thing, just so that I don't feel beholden to whatever it is that the genre is. So I think that's the first, um, I think that's the first thing. I also think that for the longest time, um, and even now, publishing is still very traditional um, and still rewards certain things. And yeah. because writers know that they try to write to the publishers rather than to the read readers. And that's where um, these wires keep getting crossed is if you're trying to write for the market or you're trying to write for the gatekeepers, um, which um, is understandable because there is such a high bar of entry um, in our field, um, this is sort of the end result. So I think my big, uh, my big answer here is gatekeepers. Um, yeah. They're the ones letting through these things and not supporting other things. That's unfortunate though. I, I guess, yeah, but we hope that eventually market forces will triumph and you know, you, you wanna write for what the market wants and the market is moving towards, you know, well-rounded characters who, you know, Character, women, women characters who are actual people. So, 
Uh, Hopefully. Oh my, this, this is a whole other conversation that I've yeah. had into. <laughs> okay. okay, well, we've talked a lot about female characters. Let's just uh, talk about male characters a little bit. So you have uh, a whole bunch of male characters in your books, and they range from monstrous misogynists to men who treat women fairly and equitably. Do you think um, reframing how stories describe men away from hostile and toxic stereotypes and towards complexity and even vulnerability can be one of the ways that uh, SFF writers can break away from these tropes that promote toxic masculinity and the dehumanization of women? A hundred percent so. Um, so this is one of the things um, that I've learned. When I was younger and I learned about like the patriarchy, I got very angry. I was like, men have everything and like, duh, duh, you know, I like I had that moment. But I have, I have like my, my um, younger cousin is like my little brother. Um, I have nephews, like I have like so many men surrounding me. Um, and what I realized was that <laughs> patriarchy not only messes um, women up, it messes men up as well, right? Because if you think about it, think about the expectations of manhood, right? It is you must be strong, you must shut away emotions, can't wear this, can't wear that, must do this, must do that. It is exhausting to be a man, right? And once I started, and especially once I, especially, um, once I started doing more research into the construction of masculin masculinity, I realized how messed up it is. I realized mm -hmm. that patriarchy um, like patriarchy literally only benefits like an elite few, right? Like it yeah. benefits like the Elon Musks of the world, right? But not to, but like how many people are Elon Musk? You know what I mean? Like how many people are like um, a rich older white dude, like that's basically a master of the universe. But even Elon Musk like has to have faced like all of the, um, all of the, the things that they tell boys that they must become. And that's the other thing. It's like, mm -hmm. when I was looking at how boys um, are taught to became, become men, it was actually painful. Because think about it, you have like a little boy who like comes out the womb, like all heart and all love. And then what's the first thing you tell him? Stop crying. Don't cry, yeah. Don't cry, men don't cry. Don't feel, men don't feel. Da, da, da. And, you, and you squeeze and you squeeze and you squeeze until you shut him down. Right. And then years later, like this little boy who came out so loving is now like basically a misogynist who like doesn't understand or believe or support women. And they're like, and you're like, oh, my gosh, how did that happen? Well, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, um, and so that that was the thing that was fast. Like one of the things that I discovered in writing these books is that there are two modes of expression for men and women women are taught to express through sadness, right? So mm -hmm. like if a woman feels any type of, um, or a femme presenting person rather, feels any type of, um, uh, I would say objectionable or adverse emotion, like anger mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. they're taught to squeeze it and constrain it and then funnel it through sadness, right? So like a lot of times you'll have like women who are so depressed when in reality they're angry, mm -hmm. but they, they are not expressing their anger because um, women are taught that it's sadness that you must express. The funny thing about men is that they're taught that anger is what they must express. So you have a lot of guys who are sad, who are distraught and devastated, but they're expressing this depression <laughs> through Dranger. anger. And that just like that blew my mind. And like, as I looked at this, I was like, you know, for me, what looks like feminism is accepting um, and, and acknowledging that we, no matter our gender expressions or sexual identities or what have you, we're all part of like, you know, one people, one race, one humanity. And if we're to move forward together, um, we have to acknowledge that each of us have things that we have to face um, and that we also like, and especially if we're trying to create a better women, a world, better world for women, we one of the ways that we have to do it is we have to create a better world for men, specifically little boys, because it's that path from extracting their emotions that we get men who are misogynists. So we have to keep little boys' hearts open um, and keep, you know, 
encouraging them and feeding that emotion as they get older so that yeah. they can connect so that we don't have the women are from Mars and men are from Venus because that's not yeah. just yeah. the way and on. yeah and stories can really help with that I suppose especially young people reading these kind of stories and, and seeing these kind of examples and yeah yeah you're right okay so speaking of stories stories are one of the most powerful ways of bringing about social change um, so let's talk about stories uh, writing stories in genre now um, the line between consent and coercion is well, isn't always clear in fantasy books. It could be epic fantasy, urban fantasy, paranormal romance. It's a, it's a big uh, culprit. Uh, certainly in some sort, subgenres of fantasy, such as grimdark, um, violence against women is still often used as a catalyst for a male character's development or as a shorthand for showing how brutal the world is. Do you think this is an issue that uh, writers in YA fantasy have started tackling successfully in recent years? Mm, I think they're starting... Um, and I think some people are highly successful, but I don't think most people are. And I mm. think um, that how we change this, um, hmm, I'm trying to frame my answer here. Um, I think that how we change this is by um, education. Um, and, and I don't mean like, oh, we have to go to school for it. No, like, so I'll, I'll frame this um, through myself. One of the things that I tend to do when I'm writing a book is um, I'm educating myself using other sources, right? But I'm using sources that don't, um, that are too difficult to digest, you know? Cause like I already did like my minor in women's studies and whatever. Like one of the things, like, so what I do nowadays is like, I watch, I watch a lot of YouTube uh, channels, right? So like one of the things that um, I really enjoyed like a couple of days ago was I was watching Cinema Therapy. Every, everybody should watch that, right? Okay, with them. Yeah, oh, you watch that? okay yeah. so did you see the one that talks about uh, Megamind and the nice guy? Uh, oh, I don't think so. Maybe. Uh, so no, like, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't watch it. Anyway, go on. <laughs> so basically, Cinema Therapy, it's like this YouTube show like where like a therapist and a filmmaker sit down and they, um, em and they watch... Um, and they watch like a movie and analyze it for a certain theme, right? Um, and usually the therapist gives like an in-depth sort of explanation of it. And so with this one, uh, the therapist was talking about um, Megamind um, and, you know, basically the curse of a nice guy and how to spot it. And like, he said so many things that like my mind was, cause I mean, like we all know nice guy TM, we've all, but like the way that he explained it to me, I was like, oh, yeah. And I'm going to use that in my next book, right? Oh, but okay. I, you know, like, I like, um, so I love stuff like that. Um, I love that, like the take. Um, there's like all sorts of like, and of course, I, I also follow like a lot of content providers. And I say all this to say that um, I am keeping like every day I'm educating myself. Like I am listening to different um, sources, different points of view. I'm not only reading, I'm supplementing, you know? And I think that a lot of times what happens is like when people sit down to write fantasy, like YA fantasy, um, I think they sit down and are like, um, and especially if they're younger, because a lot of uh, YA authors do tend to skew younger. They're just like, I'm just writing something that's like my teenage dream. Yeah. But um, right, instead of forgetting that there's like instead of remembering and, and and they do remember, but like how to express this. Um the thing about our audience is that um uh, the thing about our audience is that they are in their formative years, right? And that's why I chose to write YA was good morning, baby. Um that's why I chose to write YA was like I understood that and like I like I, I, I may fail, but I do try to educate myself and do try to, you know, but I yeah. think that sometimes like that is lacking. And I think this is like a general lack that's all across um, the arts. I went mm -hmm. to film school mm -hmm. and in my three years there, we never took an ethics class. And this for me was a huge and glaring problem. I went to USC film school. It's the best film school in the world. Yeah. No ethics class. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's one of the things is like, if you are someone in the arts, I really do think that we need to start taking a class, we need to start taking ethics as a supplement to understand that what we do and the things that we write make an, you know, have an effect on other people 
and to be mindful of that. So as much as I try to write a kick-ass, beautiful, whatever way, I'm always like in the background trying to be cognizant of that and trying to move accordingly. That was a long answer and I don't even know if I explained it, but. Yeah, you could, yeah, you kind of did. Yeah, we, I understand. So, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so in your opinion, uh, what do you think African speculative fiction can contribute to discussions of consent and violence against women? African fiction. Um, Anything special? Anything, a unique perspective maybe? African perspective. I'm trying to think, right? Um, because like, I don't want to lump the whole continent and given yeah. that like, like, you know, like Africa is the most uh, diverse and also the largest continent, I believe. So like, there's so many different cultures and so many different nuances. I think yeah, if I speak um, specifically for Sierra Leonean fiction, given that like I'm in a very small um, sort of canon, um, I do think that um, the ways that we see the world um, are, dif are slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that like, and, and I'm trying to tread carefully here because here's the thing, like Sierra Leone is supremely patriarchal, but mm -hmm. I think because of that patriarchy, um, we have a chance to like look at it, see it as it is in like very glaring terms. And then we have the chance to do something about it. So I think like that's what that offers. Like for me in particular, I write knowing that I'm writing to an audience um, and I'm writing to an audience where, you know, like girls live with their uh, personal rights um, and their bodies under threat every day. Um, and so just writing to them saying, hey, I, I see you, I see your experience, but also your experience is universal because it's not just Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I know you might not be able to do something about your circumstances right now, but like here, here, here is an understanding of your circumstances. So, you know, you're not crazy. Um, yeah. I think that's the main thing is like, I write to be like, you're not, you're not crazy. Yes, you are being gaslit and this is what it is. And I'm not saying, you know, like go out and, and act like these girls because they are, <laughs> um, you know. Yeah. They yeah. have special powers and yeah. They have special powers, but I am saying, um, understand your circumstances and then plan accordingly and move accordingly. Mm, okay. Uh, I think, you know what, it, you kind of segued into a question from the audience. So I'm just going to put this up before I go to my next question. So this is a question from uh, Misty 306. Hi, Misty. So she says, your books contain examples of situations many females experience at young ages. How can readers educate themselves to assist females in our society? That's an amazing question. Um, well, I think it starts with like reading books like the, these, um, mm -hmm. that's one way. But I think um, another way um, is to, in fact, like if you understand that like there's things um, that are wrong, um, edu like continue educating yourself. Like I love YouTube and I love YouTube because it is a free source where like if there's like any, um, and not only, well, not TikTok because TikTok overstimulates me, but like, <laughs> no, it really does. Am I the only one like where it just, I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so much coming at you. Yes. But, yeah. but the reason, one of the reasons why I love YouTube is because for anything that you have a question for, there is um, an expert, you know, yeah. you do have to, you do have to verify your experts because, you know, there's a lot of like MRA type people on there. But like, you can like, if you want to learn more about violence against women, you can follow certain sources, you know, yeah. um, you know, you can, you can follow sources, you can learn, um, you can fall like, one of the things I love is like following therapists on YouTube, because they help you unpack all the things about like misogyny and all of this stuff. Um, and you can learn how to be an advocate, you know, you can learn how to, how to, um, like help somebody like not overtake them, but like stand as a source for somebody or stand as a ally for somebody. 
Um, so I do, th I do think that that's one of the ways that you can help. I think it's first educating yourself and um, learning to not trample the people that you're trying to help because that's a huge one, you know? Yeah. You can learning how to like sort of buttress what the person is already doing. Yeah. And yeah, there's lots of uh, resources online as well. So, I mean, the Pixel Project, not to plug our own. Uh, <laughs> I was waiting for, I was, I was, I was, I was like, wow, like, Pause, plug. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, plug. Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our website has a lot of resources about violence against women, the different types, uh, you know, how to identify it, um, tips on what to do, tips for girls, tips for boys, tips for men, tips for women. And we have a lot of uh, links in our website as well to resources in different countries. And we also regularly tweet um, links to, um, resources in 205 countries around the world. So you can very easily find a resource specific to your country if you go to our website or, or just follow our Twitter feed. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of tips and things that you can do. So yeah, go check that out. Um, okay, uh, so Misty says thank you for answering her question. Uh, all right, so my next question is about violence in your books. So there is a fair amount of violence in your books, including violence against women and girls, because you know they're they're out there fighting monsters and they're fighting the patriarchy as well. How do you find a balance between showing the violence as an integral part of the story and giving the reader a realistic depiction of violence without being gratuitous? <laughs> See, you use the word I was gonna use. I don't do gratuitous violence, like. If you will notice the scenes in my book, um, every every fight scene, every scene of violence usually comes back to a point. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the thing is like, I'm very, I'm very careful about like how I outline my books, right? Because like before I ever touch um, a draft, I, I've created, um, I've written an outline, right? So like my outlines are like seven, eight pages long. Um, and so like I check and I'm like, does the scene make sense? Does it make sense in the context of the book? Does it make sense in the context of what I'm saying? Is it gratuitous? Because if I'm just like killing people just for the sheer joy of killing people, um, that does not work in these books. In my other books now, like, because let me tell you, <laughs> in my next <laughs> books, like, when it's not dealing with this subject matter, I'm about to enjoy myself because I, t I am a... I am an anime buff and, you know, I love the Tenth on Titan and all that. So <laughs> we're going to be violent. But, oh, yeah. but for these books, um, I do try to use the violent to, violence to make a point. Like for me, the Gilded Ones trilogy is, um, it's almost like a, it's almost like a statement. What is the word? Like, you know, in an essay you have, it's almost a thesis, right? It's a thesis. Um, and the three points of the book are the three parts of the thesis statement. And if, um, you know, a scene um, in one of the books does not relate to that part of the thesis that um, it's meant to, it's, it's not included. And that's how I sort of keep on theme. I am not going to promise this with my next books because my next books are just going to be, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy myself. These ones for, were for this purpose, but for the next yeah. one, I'm just saying, like, just so you know. Okay. Yeah, I don't say I just promise gratuitous okay. violence elsewhere because I'm promising that's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm excited about this. I like, okay. It, yeah, it has its place sometimes. It depends on the theme of, of what you're writing, right? The kind, the kind of story, what, what story yeah. you need. Yeah. 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 I totally right about that. Okay. So let's talk about um, geek culture because we're all geeks here in the Pixel Project. Uh, geek culture in general, including science fiction and fantasy, has had its share of critics saying that it's still too male-dominated, uh, though there are a rising number of prominent, well-respected, and well-known female authors. Plus, there's still plenty of hostile misogynist and sexist behavior by male geeks towards female geeks. So what do you think needs to be done to make geek culture as a whole, whether it's comics, or gaming, books, cons, more welcoming for women and girls? Mm -hmm. I think that's like a way larger question. Um, because <laughs> I don't even know how to like parse through this because this is my thought on ge geek culture. Like my thought is that, um, initially ge geek culture was a subculture. Now it is the culture, right? Mm 
Yeah. So it's, people are like, oh, I'm a geek. Everybody's a geek. Like, you know, like Everyone let's have their thing. Yeah. Everybody has their thing. Let's if we look. OK, so in the 80s, if you were into like, um, you know, superheroes and comics and all those things, you were an outlier. But yeah. now you're everybody. Right. Yeah. Like that's everybody's into anime. Everybody's into the things that we were like, oh, when we were a kid, we were special. No, this is what everybody likes now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing about that is like these 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 creations are heavily male dominated yeah. and are heavily focused, um, are heavily like sort of geared towards men. Um, mm -hmm. And I think especially given that like the two, I, I would say the two biggest producers of the quote unquote geek, geek culture are America and like Japan um, are super misogynistic cultures. That is all embedded in there, right? And if we're talking about the United States in general, um, I think that right now, like quote unquote geek culture is sort of in, like inextricable from like, if you're going down an internet rabbit hole, it's like inextricable from what's happening with like incel culture and all that. And that is the sad reality is that if you like, if you start going like on a, if you go on social media, and you start watching anime pretty soon you go down the um you know the misogyny pipe pipeline like yeah. i like i've noticed it because i'm like i'm over i'm over here to see overlord you know like i wanted to see um Ein Zal Gaon. like why are you talking to me about like you know the rights of men like you know like so it's like there's a very sort of clear funneling that's happening yeah. um and so how do we make uh, geek culture better uh, for women? I think we have to make the culture of the United States in general better for women, right? Um, and if we're thinking about it in terms of the fact that what's his name? Like, do you know the dude on TikTok who uh, was like a, such a heavy misogynist? He's like inspired all these young boys. Yes, and he's banned on YouTube now. Uh, he's banned I, on everything now and yeah. yet. He's either, stuck yeah, I don't remember his name and I don't want to, honestly, so... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So if we yeah, look, yeah. We, if we look at the fact that like this one guy, who like is basically like like is basically being researched for like trafficking people, <laughs> trafficking women, um, is like the talking head of our times. Even though he's been deplatformed, but he still has a huge platform despite being deplatformed. Um, we sort of like know. Um, like that's the, that's that's the ocean, that's the water that we're swimming in right now. Um, and in order to make things better, we have to like start from the root, which is like how do we, we educate um, kids? How do we educate yeah. um, everyone? Right. Right. And, and so yeah, yeah I, I don't know if I have like a great answer for this yeah. one because it's 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 so it's so pervasive. Like it's like tentacles. Yeah. So you mentioned just now that you know, like in the eighties. These were geeks were people who who thought who were kind of special because they were different, right? But I think maybe it's it's that kind of some people haven't lost that feeling of like I'm special. This is special to me, and if I have to share it with everyone else, it's not special anymore, and there's no room for anyone else. So yeah, yeah, yeah we had a we had some authors on uh, on before who said something like um, it's not a pie. It's not a pie that if you slice it up and you know there's not going to be enough for you. It's it's enough for everybody to share. So, yeah, so it's not the correct. There's an yeah. entitlement to geek culture. Yes, yes, yeah, and uh, yeah. Perhaps we do need to start with educating the the boys and the men. And yeah, okay. So, um, everybody, there is a few more minutes left for your questions to come in. So, if you have any last questions for Namina, please ask them. Meanwhile, I'm going to my last cluster of questions for you, Namina. So um, you've been so very incredibly supportive of our Read for Fixes campaign and our anti-violence against women work as a whole. So this is a bit of a Captain Obvious questions question, but we ask it. Uh, why do you support the cause to end violence against women? And what do you think authors can do to help with the cultural change needed to eradicate violence against women? I mean, because it's, it's I like I'm a woman, you know, in this world, <laughs> I live in this body um, and it affects me. You know, I I grew up from feeling like my body was under threat like that is and that is an experience that pretty much every girl, every femme presenting person in this world has experienced. So if, like that's why I support um, 
you know, ending violence against women because like, <laughs> it's me, like, you know, it's me, it's, it's, it's my friends, it's my family, it's everybody that I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yet, another, and, mm -hmm. and when you say everybody, you literally mean everybody, right? Yes. Like, yeah, because vile, like part of violence against women, like, I think that's the other thing is like, when we talk about um, violence against women, we forget that it occurs on a spectrum of just mm -hmm. violence where um, everybody has something to lose and everybody does suffer, not just women, not just femme presenting people, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a societal ill that we have to have to figure out. Yeah. So I think you're going to ask me what my sec the second part of the question was, which is yeah. what, what can authors do to help with the social change? Um, I think we can be more responsible in how we write. Um, we can show, um, we can have uh, better sort of depictions of consent and, you know, things of that nature. And granted, the thing about art is like people do have to be free to express themselves and express their understanding of things because like not every book is going to do that, nor do I expect every book to. But I think especially with books that skew for younger audiences, middle grade and young adult, um, if we know we are offering a fantasy, you know, we can at least try to create a fantasy um, that serves to create a better world. Yeah, that's it. That's a but, again, not every, but I'm not saying that every author has to do that. I'm just saying, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, that was our last question. So if you don't have any more questions, we're going to um, start our wrap up. Um, but before that, um, I want to thank you, Namina, for your excellent answers. And it was so insightful and uh, learning about your process and how you address feminism and violence against women in your books. Uh, thank you so much to audience questions, audience who ask questions. Uh, we have a few people in the audience. One person asked a question. Um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> um, it brings us to the end of the session. But before we go, I want to tell you again, in case you missed it, uh, the in case you missed the beginning of the live stream, Namina has very generously donated a whole bunch of exclusive goodies to the stash of swag we have set up on our Rally Up fundraising page. So I'm going to tell you what they are again. We have three bundles. Um, Bundle number one is Namina for Nas first edition Gilded Ones Goodie Bundle. This is for US donors only. So this comprises one signed first edition hardcover of the Gilded Ones novels, which are the Gilded Ones and the Merciless Ones. This is book one and book two. And one handwritten note from Namina herself, one Gilded Ones character card, one print of the map of the Gilded Ones world, and one pre-order pin. This is a huge bundle. So uh, bundle number two is from Random, Random House Children's Books, and this comprises one paperback edition of The Gilded Ones. This is unsigned. And one print map of the world of The Gilded Ones. Okay, and goodie number three, this is an amazing one, is a 30-minute Zoom call with Namina Forna. And this is for a Read for Pixels donor anywhere in the world. Namina will be happy to chat with you about the art and craft of writing, publishing books, your favorite Gilded Ones characters, and more with you on your group. Um, her awesome dog may make an appearance as well. <laughs> so hi. Hi. Book clubs and libraries. Yes. Yeah, so this is open to book clubs, libraries, or individual donors. So this is an awesome opportunity to meet a great fantasy author. We can give you all kinds of advice. And this is just one, there's only one of the session available. So you, please donate now to book a slot with Namina. And um, there we have plenty more, uh, lots of stuff from other authors. So we have things from Rin Chebeko, Ellen Baxter, Romina Garber, Kwame Mbalia, Roseanne A. Brown, Sue Ann Jafarian, Sujata Macy, Eugene Bacon, Jeffy Kennedy, Charlie Ann Holmberg. We have bundles from Tor Books UK and Random, Random House Children's Books and more. So as of now, we've raised $1,885 towards our $5,000 goal. So please do give generously before the fundraiser ends in October, October this year. So I'm going to share some slides. Here we go. So um, that's the link. OK, so uh, you can donate at, to get these goodies at our Rally Up fundraising page. That's tinyurl.com, R4P Rally Ups 2022. Um, Denisha has put the links up in the chat box already so we just go click on that and then if you want to find out more about 
the Read for Pixels campaign, all the other authors we have coming up, do go to our website, to the Read for Pixels page, and that link is going up in the chat box as well. And we also want to tell you about the amazing um, charity anthology that we've put together. So this is the Pixel Project's first charity anthology. It's called Giving the Devil His Due, and it's sort of like the Twilight Zone meets Promising Young Woman. Uh, and it's a book of short stories, and they're all kind of like revenge horror stories uh, where villain, uh, violent men <laughs> get their comeuppance. Um, so we have teamed up with 12 of the 16 authors featured in the anthology to offer an exclusive limited edition uh, book plate. Each author will sign 16 book plates and it'll be on a first come first serve basis. Each book plate includes a resource for domestic violence and sexual assault victims and survivors in 205 countries. So if you want to find out more about the anthology and how to score a book plate, go to our Giving the Devil His Due page on our website and the link is going up in the chat box as well. And if you, uh, you're interested in getting the anthology yourself, uh, you can order it from any major bookseller worldwide. It's on Amazon, Kobo, Google Play, Book Depository, and more. Um, this is an ebook, by the way. Um, all the proceeds, all net proceeds, go towards keeping the Pixel Project's campaigns, programs, and initiatives such as this one alive and kicking. All right. So if you want to find out more about um, the Pixel Project, about the work we do, and all the resources I mentioned earlier, go to our website. It's www.thepixelproject.net. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our session. Oh, I think, Namina, you have a, an announcement, something to say about book number three. Oh, oh um, well, I, <laughs> I just uh, <laughs> say The Gilded Ones is a trilogy. Book one and book two are out now, and book three will be out sometime next year. Very soon. Yes. <laughs> and we all can't wait. Yeah. So uh, that's why, by the way, that's why there are only two books in, I, I mentioned this trilogy, but there are only two books in the in the Goody Bundle because Namina's working very hard on the last book and she's coming out next year. All right, so thank you so much, Namina, for being with us. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And we'll say good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world, and goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.